thank you that no matter whatever battle that we may be facing, we know that the victory is yours. And that you go before us and you are fighting our battles for us. Amen, amen, amen. We believe that you're a God of triumph and you're a God who never. For you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We pray this in your name. Throwing toys. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the Vineyard Community Church. Uh, we're so glad that you um, could join us. There you go. Here at the Vineyard and all of you at home. Um, our service today is streaming live on Facebook. Uh, we are continuing our sermon series. The call, Pastor Brent Paulson's message today is. Um, about the call of Peter found in Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Grab your Bible or your cell or your tablet to look up today's text. You will also find it printed in a bulletin. Remember um, the Vineyard membership class today following this service, 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the fellowship hall. For those who are reading um, a chapter a day, the Gospels for Easter. Tomorrow we begin reading the Gospel of John. If you haven't been taking part or aren't there yet, consider reading John. Read one chapter a day and we'll finish on Easter Sunday. <laughs> for those, <laughs> our Food Resource Center and Food Box Assembly is closed for this week. It's the fifth Sunday, I mean the fifth Tuesday rather. Our Food Pantry operates four weeks a month and is closed when there is a fifth Tuesday. We will be open again next week, April 4th and 5th. Thanks to everyone who showed up for our church spring cleaning day. Great job. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> um, our women's, women's workshop and brunch is coming. Finally back. Saturday, April 23rd, um, 11.30 to 2.30, we begin the quest by Beth Moore. Watch this exciting video and sign up in the lobby. Oh, if these trees could talk, the questions they tell you they've heard me ask of God out here in these woods. Lord, what is going on in my life right now? What am I supposed to do with this? Jesus, where is your heart on this? What do you want here? What does Christ's likeness look like here? Because we're just inundated with questions. You know, I consider it that we are question marked. And I'm going to suggest to you that's not just because we're human. That's because we're created in the image of God. Part of the quest is questions. I would love to ask you to join me on this excursion toward intimacy with God. This is Bible study meets prayer journal. This is the emphasis on dialoguing with God, where you're not just answering my questions, you're answering His and you're answering them straight to Him. It is going to be an adventure. I pray that God's going to find you right on that path and take you to a place you have never been before. Come along. What have you got to lose? We are going to have an adventure. <laughs> what do you think? Looks pretty exciting, doesn't it? So we are on a quest, and all of us women are going. And we would like all of you women out there and all of you women listening at home to join us on a quest. And a quest for what? It's a quest that God wants. He, 
Nope. It's something he wants from each of us. He wants to be closer to each of us. And it's a quest to go deeper with God. Starts at 1130 and we are done about 230. And then once a month until September, we will be brunching together and we'll watch a video with Beth Moore, who is wonderful. And we will talk together. But the rest of our quest will be the little workbook assignments that you do at home, just you and God. If you have never been to one of our women's brunches, you need to come. It's, it's wonderful. We just all love each other and don't be afraid. Oh my gosh, I don't want to talk in front of people. You talk or as little, you talk as little or as much as you want as the spirit guides you. So don't feel like you have to talk. I don't like to talk in front of people. So don't worry about that. Please join us. As you can see, quite a few of us are rather excited about this already. Now we've been working on purchasing um, gently used workbooks so that, because our hope is what we want to do is provide this as a free thing for all of you women. So women, there's, so there's no reason for you not to be able to come sign up in the back talk to one of us come on to quest with us <laughs> denise might find you if you if you don't come thank you intrepid explorers <laughs> um, don't forget today's offering we have a small table set up in the back of the sanctuary um, for your offering or donate on our church website. And uh, I promised I would do this before service. Um, um, Arlene Ring called my grandmother, uh, Wilmer Bishop, in case you don't know that, um, and asked to um, hold Alan Jr. up in prayer. He has been experiencing um, neurological issues for, for, some, for some time now. And today they're going to do an MRI um, at noon. So, um, Brent, would you come up and, and lead us in prayer for that before you start the sermon? You know how much the rings are part of this community. Alan Sr. is struggling. Alan Jr. is struggling. God, we pray for your mercy, your protection over this family, Lord, from all these things coming on them. And for to take fear away, to bring healing to Alan Jr., bring healing to Alan Sr. too. Just let your kingdom come, let your will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. To, uh, to be regular in their offerings to God. Teresa and I, real early on in our Christian life, somebody told us that we should be tithing. And I was like, eh, eh, what's tithing? And then they told us, and we're like, what? You can't do that. You don't have any money left, you know? And, uh, but we just started. And I don't know. We still have money. And uh, it's, um, we've had to do a little robbery to get, keep it up. But, you know, it's been okay. Um, not really. Uh, it's not as bad when it's on video. You know, people could take it out of context, I suppose. Um, so, also, uh, speaking of that, so you can give online, you can give in the back, you can write checks, you can go on a Facebook site and give. Lots of ways to give. I think Facebook actually doesn't charge us anything, is that right? Face, um, PayPal charges like 3%. Uh, or two and a half percent or something. And uh, we've looked into some other options, but they're all kind of expensive. There's like the text to give thing. We've looked into some of those. Those are pretty spendy. They take a pretty high percent. So anyway, we're trying to be good stewards. Um, along with that, if you're like me, I kind of flick through 
different news channels on and stuff just to see what's happening to see if 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 they started shooting nuclear bombs here so I have a few minutes to get in the basement you know on the news but um, more than that just to to uh, see if there's anything I can be praying for and doing about what's going on in in Ukraine and other places in the world but especially in the Ukraine and so the vineyard has partnered with Convoy of Hope which is a a uh, really cool Christian organization that does a ton of relief work everywhere. When Katrina hit, they were one of the first people on site with with food, with help, with all kinds of stuff. In fact, most, a lot of people don't know that one of the vineyard churches down there became the central place where everybody kind of docked out of all the workers and stuff. They had trailers all over. They had the whole facility became a became a service place. And so Convoy Hope does that, but they're in you know, uh, they're right now they're in Poland and various other places. So you can go on Vineyard, Vineyard USA on their website or just go on Convoy of Hope and you can do that if you want to. Or our website, yeah. Go on our website. It just links you right to there. So, Well, again, Father, we just pray for your words, for your grace, for your mercy. Many of us are tired and kind of weary from just cleaning up the house that you allowed us to worship in. So bless it and bless these words today. Amen. So I wanted to start out with some, just some, today we're starting a passage where Jesus is actually asking a question. And usually often when Jesus asks a question or when God asks you a question, it's not really because he doesn't know the answer. You know? It's like, it's like certain questions your parents might ask you when you're growing up, like, they're not asking you because they want to know the answer. They're asking you, like, because, yeah, I already know you did this. So, um, but there are some questions that are kind of interesting. One of the questions, I was reading through some stuff, and Rich Nathan was asking a question of whether interstate highways in Hawaii, you know, just think about it. It's like, okay. And then the other question, which I thought was, has always been interesting, is the break a leg thing for actors and actresses and performers before they go on stage and... And then there's the whole thing I've talked about before, which is counter steering on a motorcycle where when you want to go this way, you turn the front wheel this way, right? It doesn't seem to work phys in physics, but try it sometime. It works really good. That's, if you ever watch the race motorcyclists, they'll be like leaning way over. Their tire's not going like this. It's going like this. It's really weird. But anyway, it has something to do with physics, which is... Why I'm a pastor, because I didn't want to take physics. So, um, But I know that that happened. So anyway, I did find out um, inter there is an interstate highway in Hawaii. Does anybody know why? Take a stab. Federal funding, yeah. That's one of it. It was actually set up originally so that there would be ease of, of military things from one part of the country to the other with the least kind of thing going on. And so that's why you have interstates, even in Hawaii. They'd set it up for kind of a military, military possibilities in the future. There's several other reasons. Um, the freeway systems in particular, some of those were racial, some of those were set up because of racial things, and stuff like that. But um, So anyway, that's why we have one in Hawaii. And then the break a leg thing was really interesting because there's about 3,000 answers. You know, one of them was break a leg means do a good performance so you can bow. But the one that kept coming back over and over again is the one that every sports fan kind of knows. And that's like if somebody's going to shoot a free throw and they've shot like 15 in a row, what do you not want to do? You don't want to say break a leg, but you also, you also you don't want to go, whenever, it, whenever the, one of the broadcasters goes, he's hit 15 in a row, everybody's, no, don't say it. Because this idea, if you say it, guess what? You're going to jinx. You know, we're, we're pretty superstitious people. So break a leg from a lot of the different sites that I looked on, from musicians to actors to dancers, had to do with the idea that rather than say good luck or do well, which they're afraid would jinx them, they say break a leg, which should have a reverse. Anyway, so. Aren't we weird people? We're just weird. We live in all this. We're kind of semi-pagans, aren't we? All right, so, um, yeah, it's just true. 
So, ye- so yesterday, we were, many, many of you showed up in, um, just, just speaking it like it is, um, many of you showed up and it was kind of neat. I was here and I was thinking when I was walking around, there was a bunch of older people, newer people, younger people, different, you know, I'm sure a lot of these people have different struggles and stuff going on in their lives. Some are probably sad, some are probably struggling with some stuff, but but I thought, this is the body of Christ. This is Christ's community. And then when everybody was sitting down to eat, it was just really neat. I just had this kind of picture of Jesus sitting down with his disciples, you know? We were sitting there having pizza with, with soap scum and stuff everywhere. You know, we're all like kind of grungy and we smell like various chemicals. But, um, but we're sitting there eating pizza together. And, and it was so cool, and it was so cool because there was a bunch of new people there. That was really awesome. A lot of young people, which, which for me, even though I'm pretty young, it's nice to see young people that are there that can kind of begin to move into some of the roles that eventually some of us are not going to be doing after a while. Um, so anyway, uh, it's exciting to see. And, and Jesus speaks of a church. Church isn't something humans create. It's not something that we just one day were thinking about and saying, you know what, we should, we have, this, we have this cool thing with Jesus, this relationship with Jesus. Why don't we like all get together and share about our relationship with Jesus? It's not like that. It's one of the whole of scripture was to create a people. Do you know that the word church in the Bible is ecclesia, which means uh, a community, a community of people. Israel was considered a community. They were divided into 12 tribes, but they were a community of the people of God. You know what our primary identity is, whether we're Republican, Democrat, American, Ukrainian, Russian, whatever we are. If we're Christian, what is our primary identity? We're, we're, we belong to Jesus. In fact, Peter goes so far as to say this. He said, but you are a chosen people. Whether or not you believe it, God chose you. A lot of us have a hard time with that because we look at ourselves and go, I wouldn't choose me. You know, really. If I was like picking somebody to pastor this church, I'd be like, man, now let's pass on Brent. You know, let's move on. Next, next. Um, But we're chosen people. You are too. Every one of you that's here is chosen. You're supposed to be here. Even if you're coming for the first time and you don't even know what's going on and you're like, what is this all about? You're supposed to be here. We're a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. We not only stand in the presence of God with Jesus, you know, opening the way to God. We're a royal priesthood. Priests do two things. One is they present, they they um, go in God's presence and 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 dwell there. But they also represent God to people around them. And so we do that. We act in that way. We act like a priest to people. And we can speak life into people's lives. He says, we're a holy nation. We're we're one people. We're holy. Do you know know that you belong? There's an identity that goes deeper, deeper than than your heritage, than your genealogy, than your citizenship, than being an American, than being anything else. There's something for a Christian that goes way deeper than that. You're a holy nation nation. God's special possession that you may, and we have a purpose, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful life. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Many of us were not a people. I was not a people for a while. For a while I was a, a druggie and that was kind of my peeps. My peeps. I didn't now, you know, and then once I quit, I didn't have any friends. I discovered but all my friends, the only reason that we hung out was drugs. And most, the, reason, most, the main reason they hung out with me is because I had lots of drugs. And so, but once you quit doing that, you don't have a people anymore. And part of being part of this community, and part of getting the, be- the greatest benefit out of this community is to become part of the people of God. There's some, nothing better than that. That's why we do small groups. That's why we do um, studies like, like the women are doing, like going hiking to kill him. Where are you hiking to? I forgot. Okay. 
So whenever they go hiking, man, we'll just do a man cave thing. So, um, so once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so there's this amazing picture of this. And, and today we're going to look at the very beginnings, not only of the church, but we're going to answer three significant questions. The first one is, who is Jesus? Who do you say I am? Because Jesus asked Peter that. He asked the disciples that. Who do you say I am? Second, we're going to ask, what is the church? What's that got to do with anything? And then third, we're going to talk about the authority of the church. What has God given us? Uh, you know, how, how do we exist? And so let's read the scripture for this morning. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Now, this is just after he had been questioned by the Pharisees. They wanted him to do a sign. They had already predetermined that he was demonized or he was working on behalf of Satan and he was the enemy. You know how, how funny we are? We predetermine things about people because of culture. And God shows up and guess what? You're not God. Let me tell you what God should be like basically what the Pharisees were doing. But he asked, who do people say that I am? So they replied, some said John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then this is the most significant question you can probably ever answer in your whole life. In fact, it is. There's no other more important question. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So, Lord, bless our words today. So, there's this question, who are you? Who do you say I am? And that's the first question I'm going to look at in this. In, in Peter's reply, he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus goes on and said, you know what, Peter? Flesh and rock did not reveal this to you. And on this rock, Peter's name was a kind of a plan, words for Petros, Petros, rock. On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the first question Jesus asked, and people had all kinds of different answers. And don't, people have a ton of answers in our culture. If, you're at, if you were to go like down to any, a lot of streets and a lot of places, universities or whatever, say, who is Jesus? People go, oh, he's a, he's a great religious teacher like Buddha or like you know, Hare Krishna and whoever. You know, he's, um, he's just a great religious teacher. Or they might say he was just a really nice guy. Or they might say he was a myth that people created to kind of make themselves feel better. And so there's a lot of different answers. But there's one answer that, that's right in this whole process. Because in some ways, Jesus wasn't any of those things. He wasn't John the Baptist that had come back. That's what... Um, one of the kings was afraid of because he had John the Baptist beheaded. And there's nothing worse than, you know, beheading somebody and then have them come back and visit you. You know, I mean, that's just, that's just creepy. So, it's like, <laughs> that's like, a, what's his name, Jordan Peele, not Jordan Peele movie? Is he the one that does the movie? Um, so, some, some people thought that, like, well, maybe he's kind of resurrected John the Baptist. And it's like, well, it, probably not because... John baptized Jesus. They were both there at the same time. You know, it's kind of gets into a whole another area. But the other one was, was Jeremiah. He, so evidently Jesus wasn't seen as kind of this tame, gentle, gentle person. Jeremiah was pretty fiery. So was Elijah. So maybe it's Elijah. He was pretty fire, full of spectacular miracles and stuff. But then Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? Because that's really what matters. And what Jesus has been doing, this whole process, is shaping them and shaping us to understand better who he is. And it comes down to this one thing, and Peter gets it. He's starting to put two together. Peter's journey with Jesus started way back in Luke 5, when Peter's out fishing all night, not catching anything. 
Jesus comes along, says, go throw your nets out of the other side of the boat. Peter's like, you're a fisherman, or you're a, you're a carpenter, or maybe some carpenter slash pastor, whatever you are. You don't know anything about fishing, but because you said so, we'll go do it. And they go do it, and they pull in this great hall. And suddenly Peter begins to progressively understand more about who Jesus is. And when he comes in, he starts out by saying, you know, calling him master, kind of being nice to him. But then he moves from that, once the fish start coming in, he says, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a, sin a sinful man. Isn't that funny? Everybody God calls, everybody who has these first encounters, the first thing they think disqualifies them is what? That we're a sinner. That we're bad. If, if it, somebody knew the struggles I have inside, they would never let me do this, you know, kind of thing. That's pe what Peter's saying. And he was right. But you know what? If you're God and you're picking out of humanity all the unsinful people, there aren't any. <laughs> you know, God's like, all right, I'll work with, with whatever you give me. You know, God's the ultimate MacGyver, like, I can, I can use that. I can fix that. You know? He can fix and use anything and, you, and accomplish his purposes through us. And so, you know, he ta you know MacGyver will take like a, a piece of thread and then, you know, build it into a turbojet fighter with machine guns. You know, it's like, wow, this is amazing. So, um, so anyway, so, so, so Peter's on this journey. Knowing who Jesus is, he says, depart from me. And then Jesus calls him. That was Peter's call. He said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Do not be afraid. Well, later on now, Peter's again the first one that steps up. He's been following Jesus. They've all been following Jesus. They've seen him heal people. They've seen him deliver people. They've seen him do stuff that normal prophets and teachers and good men don't do. Like raising Lazarus from the dead. Like casting out demons like walking on water, like calming storms, like feeding 15,000 people. I can, I can kind of picture after each of those events them going, this is not normal. You know, this is not, this, this is something really unique is going on here. Do you get it? Something unique is happening. And yet, still, they're not quite sure who Jesus is. And what he's doing is systematically demonstrating and teaching them who he is. In Mark, Matthew's Gospel, he teaches them a lot about the ethics of the kingdom. You've heard it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, do not look at a woman lustfully. And all the guys go, oh. But finally, they get to this place, and Jesus says, you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one that that our hopes and dreams, the hopes and dreams of all the years are met in you tonight. That everything we've been waiting for, Jesus, is you. You are it. Now, Peter didn't fully understand what it was yet. Because right after this, in the chapter when Jesus said, and the Son of Man must be you know, carried off by the rulers and authorities, be crucified, die, and on the third day be raised, Peter rebukes him and says, no, Lord, don't let that happen to you. So he still, has, he still doesn't really fully grasp the mission and purpose of Jesus, but he under, he's beginning to understand who he is, and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and his understanding of who Jesus is is growing. I went from like high school and a little bit post-high school studying like Eastern religions. Somebody brought me once to this Guru Maharaj thing or something, and they they were sitting in these things, and it felt kind of weird. And you know, I was just trying to get sober and stuff, and they're bringing me, in. and I was like, "What's behind that door?" I heard weird noises, and they go, "Oh, you can't go in there." And I'm like, "Ugh, that's weird," you know. And then I saw a picture of this Guru Maharaj, and he's there, and he literally had a wall full of gold rolled rices, and I and he said, "Oh, this is a Guru Maharaj," and I thought, I said, "I thought he's not into materialistic." He goes, "Oh, he's not. He's not. He just." He just takes what we give him and turns it into gold. I'm like, okay, I think that's the very definition of materialistic. But um, so I wasn't really interested in that. And then, you know, I didn't. I thought Jesus was just another good guy, another good teacher. But then, process. God, God begins 
working and teaching and having me read and people were giving me these things. Somebody gave me a book by C.S. Lewis called The Four Loves because my big argument at Christians where they were kind of stupid and naive, which we are sometimes, aren't we? Come on, let's admit it. Yeah, we are sometimes. So anyway, um, but the reality was he gave me this book and I'm reading and it's C.S. Lewis and I thought, I don't know anything about Christianity, and I don't know anything about love. I thought I knew what love was, and it rocked me. And then somewhere along that journey, and I've shared it many, many a times driving out west, along that journey I went from not believing to believing, to knowing, to being able to say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I was about to find out more and more what that meant and who he was and what that meant for my life. You are the Christ. And, and Matthew says, or Jesus says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this. There's a sense in which I sat around and just went, I don't get what all these people got. And I don't get how to get it. I don't know how to get it. You know, how do you get it? Do you have to, like, come up front? Do you have to raise your hand? What do you do to, what do you do to get this thing? Well, p- part of it, to be honest, Jesus is saying, It is given as a gift from the Father. He has to open our eyes to it. And why why does God do that? He does that because it, it, it democratizes salvation in a sense. It opens the doors for everyone. If only people that were really intelligent and could figure out mysteries and stuff could become Christians because they could read enough books and figure it out enough, it would leave out all the other people. We used to work with people who were physically and mentally challenged. Do you know how many of those people came to know Jesus? Why? Because it wasn't a requirement to be, you know, a, a mensa to enter the kingdom. And over the years, we've seen just so many other people from various backgrounds. Rich Nathan says this. He says, but is, when he's talking about people saying, well, if you're good enough, you get into heaven. He says, but it is, is it a little... Th- thing to say if you're good enough God will accept you no that's a huge thing it's a huge thing because what is good enough how do you know when good enough has been got you know that's what the Pharisees were all about well you can watch walk this many don't you know don't break the Sabbath well you can walk whatever how this many steps you walk one more you broke the Sabbath you know you're always doing that stuff but he says the funnel that leads to God is bigger than that because the gospel message is not just for good people. See, every system in the world says good people get in, the bad people are kept out. But the, in the gospel it says, I'm welcoming everyone who will go through Jesus. Everyone, people who are successful, people who are failures, people who are loved by their parents, and people who are abused by their parents. Everyone who, everyone who were valedictorian, Victorians and people who were dropouts, the gospel says everyone and anyone can come to God through Jesus. Millionaires and folks that are bankrupt. People who live in million dollar homes and people who live in a tent. Accountants and addicts. Doctors and divorced people. Kids and 80 year olds. Everyone and anyone can come to God through Jesus. Christianity is the only truly universal faith. It's not tied to any ethnic group. It's not tied to any nationality, culture, language, skin color, your height, your weight. People from every culture, every language, every religious background, able-bodied, disabled, can come to God through Jesus. Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. Jesus bids you come. He goes on and he says, you're right, Peter. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed. God has opened your eyes. And what you can pray for people is the eyes of their heart would be open. And we can pray for ourselves. God, open the eyes of my heart. Because there are levels and understandings of who God is that continue to grow and continue to be astounded at the greatness of God. After so many years, I read Scripture and I go, oh, or, or I'll just see creation and I'll think, that is so, so cool. Who would have thought of that? I mean, even our best, like, animators and Marvel Comics guys can't think of some of the things God thought of. I mean, they're just wait, you know, and just saying. Um, anyway, who do people say that I am? 
And then he goes on and he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's, you know, I've heard that dialogued about many times. It means um, gates of death, but also I think it means the gates of Satan, the, the kind of the boundaries and barriers that Satan puts up, the, the um, walls, if you will, that he puts up. And part of it could be related to his attack. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. They won't prevail against death when Jesus is crucified, when Paul is killed, when Peter is killed, when we die. The gates of death, the gates of hell do not prevail. God prevails. We win. We win. I read, like John Wimbrey used to say, I read, read when people would ask him about the, like, when is the end times? You know, are we in the end times? And he goes, I don't know, he said, but I read the book and, and we win. I'm like, cool, you know, I finished the book and we won. And that's a reality and the gates of hell can be all kinds of things in everybody's life, I think. They can be barriers and boundaries that, that keep us out. And later on when he talks about the keys to the kingdom and loosing and binding and all that stuff, I think he's called us to be people who open up doors I think he's called us to be people who step into places where the gates of hell have literally surrounded and embodied a place. Many years ago, some of you were here, Terry Planton was, and a few of the others. There used to be projects down on West 25th Street. We used to go down there all the time and give out food, and then we set up a, a Christmas giveaway, actually, for a long time, was we'd find out all the kids' names down there, and we would go down there and give them all gifts. We'd go around to all these apartments, and these were... These were some pretty nasty projects. I mean, the kind of projects, like when we went there, there were guys with long coats and shotguns at each of the entrances to the apartments buildings. And they come up to you and they go, what do you want? And we're like, I'm going to give away food. And they're like, okay, go. And we're like, okay. You know, that isn't really how it went. It was more like, what do you want? And we're like, we just want to give away food, please. <clears throat> please don't shoot us. Um, but we did that for years, and you know what ended up happening? Walls began falling down. Satan's gates, Satan's kingdom began taking a hit. In, um, in the 60s and 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, there was I can't remember his last name, but it was, or his full name, but it was a Polish man named Wolodzowski, or I think, that was Pope John from Paul II. Have you heard of him? He was the first, I think the first Polish Pope. And he, almost single-handedly, along with other, there were other things going on, obviously, but he was one of the main forces in bringing down the Iron Curtain the Berlin Wall. Some of you didn't grow up with that going on. I grew up knowing that if you were on the east side of that wall, you, you couldn't do or say anything. You lived in fear of the, of the S, whatever they were called back then, the Russian police and the East German police. You lived in fear of that. You lived in kind of this stuff all the time under immense oppression. And along came this young pope who became a priest who ultimately, or this young man who ultimately became a priest and then became the pope. And in that process began just preaching and teaching Jesus to communities and more communities and more communities and more communities. And part of that came across some of these kind of passages in the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he began, you know, just speaking out in a, in a biblical way against some of what was going on and he was kind of threatened and attacked and had all kinds of things happen. But one of the things that happened in that process is that seed of the kingdom that he planted and later on we'll get into that. But there was a seed that he was sowing throughout all Eastern Europe and it began sprouting and Lekwanza, the, the um, labor leader that helped kind of bring down the the Iron Curtain in Poland and stuff like that. A bunch of people were touched, but mostly it was, it was, 
it was done without any armies. In fact, one writer says, despite having no armies under his command and no weapons to deploy, Pope John Paul II played a pivotal role in one of the 20th century's greatest geopolitical dramas, the struggle against the Soviet Union's forceful dominance in Asia and Eastern Europe. Through public statements, private negotiations, repeated trips to his native Poland, John Paul helped undermine communist rule in his home country in 1989. The event re reverberated through the other Soviet bloc countries, such as Hungary, East Germany, Romania, sparking a chain reaction of revolutions, most of them nonviolent. Today that re region is largely free and democratic. Parts of it aren't right now, we know. Years later, Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader at that time, reflected and said, it would not have been possible without the Pope. And I'm not saying that that's, you know, it just takes a Pope, but what I'm saying is it takes a follower of Jesus and one, one person affected a whole world. Can you imagine what a whole group and whole community of people, the people of God, surrendered to God can do? And that's the second you know, my second point is that God came to create a community. He came to create a church. He came to create a people. Do you know who Jesus is coming back for? His church. Being part of community is, to me, is essential to being a Christian, to being a follower of Jesus. People are always like, well, I can be a Christian and just follow Jesus by myself. And I'm like, I don't think Paul or Jesus ever thought of Christianity like that. That's kind of an American idea. The idea is that we need to be in community. We're, when Jesus word, used the term church, it comes from a Greek word, ekklesia, which means um, assembled people. And we assemble around a common person, and that person is Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm building my church, and the gates of hell will not come against it. In fact, um, in uh, Ephesians 2, Paul talks about the church. And he says this, I've, you know, the longer I've been a Christian, the higher view of, a ch of church I have. And this passage sometimes has been used, if you're Catholic, it's been used for apostolic succession. You know, Peter was the first pope, and then upon this rock, and then each generation there's another pope. Um, Protestants typically take it to mean that the, the church is those who believe and hold to the statements and the confession that Peter gave. I think it's, there's a little bit of both. I don't think necessarily Peter was Pope. He was an apostle. But I believe that God did use him and the early church to establish and build the church. He says in Ephesians 2, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens and God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. You are no longer strangers, but fellow citizens. Those who are new, those who are old, you are fellow citizens. We live in a very divided culture. Here's something that can unite. With Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in him the whole building is joined together, rises up to become a holy temple in the Lord, and in him too, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. We are to be a community, an ecclesia, an assembly of God's people where He chooses to bring His Shekinah glory down, just like He did in the tent in the wilderness where He came upon this mobile tabernacle and the presence of God would fall on it. And the presence of God falls upon His people today as we come together and as His body comes together and as we express the gifts and the abilities and the, the words and the thoughts that we all have, you're here for a reason, you're here for a purpose. Church is the place now where God has chosen for heaven and earth to kiss. Throughout history, there have been places where heaven and earth, heaven and earth used to coexist like this. And when the fall came, there was a rift, and heaven and earth were separated. And when Jesus came, he began to heal that rift. And when he shed his blood and, and, and forgave our sins, we were suddenly able to be brought back into the kingdom. And the kingdom began this process of moving 
more and more into this world and transforming more and more lives, including mine, including yours. This transformation process is, is done in and through the, the kingdom of God working through the church. The church is not the kingdom. We're not the kingdom of God. That gets dangerous real quick. But we are a vessel through whom God allows his kingdom to be worked. I, I, I get so excited when I hear stories about everything you guys have been doing. That is so cool to me. You don't know. You know, I get to hear it more. You don't know how many people have been doing how many things every day. You know, from going out and greeting people out in, on cold days when the food's being handed out. God bless you as people drive by. We had so many people this week go, thank you so much for doing that. I said, it ain't no big thing. It's how we roll around here. That's what I said. <clears throat> Just saying. Not all of us, not all, not all of us pick Villanova, Jim. So... The last part of this is the authority of the church. So you, you kind of get it. So there's Jesus, there's a confession that, that leads us to not just an individual relationship with Jesus. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And God has to open your eyes, and that progressively gets bigger, like I've shared before. For me, it started out with just saying yes to Jesus and not believing one day and, you know, in the car and the next day believing because I just, something happened where the, the lights were turned on. I love in in, in 2 Corinthians 4, where Paul says, for, for God of Christ, we could see who Jesus was. And for me, and he uses the, the picture of like creation itself when God let, said, let there be light, and suddenly there was light. And then he created the sun and the moon. Go figure that. That's a cool physics thing, isn't it? Creates light and then creates sun and moon, you know. Um, but the second thing was, he's, he's, the, he's the unlimited source of all things that has all power and all energy the only thing in the world that does not need an energy source to burn or use he is self self-energized and he says he talks about the authority of the church Jesus replied but blessed are you Simon of Jonah for this is not what God Revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Never you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So God turns the light on, just like the light of creation. He said, let there be light. In my life one day, he said, let there be light. Suddenly I saw, you know, like Hank Williams said, I saw a light, you know. I saw the light. Some of you don't know who that is. Look up Hank Williams, cool singer. Um, I saw the light. I began to understand more about who Jesus is. I began to understand my role in being part of this body, this thing he calls the body, and the only way I will fully grow and become complete in who I am is being part of one of these communities that God has set out there. And third of all, that he's given us immense authority in this process. People have debated for years about what this means, you know. Um, keys to the kingdom. Does that mean that you get to keep people out? For some churches it means that, well, we decide who's in and out of the kingdom, you know. Like if today we decide Pat can't be in the kingdom. Sorry, Pat, you're out, you're out, you know. We just decided. Why? Have you really? That is so sad. That's really sad. No, it's not true here. If, if you give me certain amounts of money, it's not true. Um, but the reality is that, um, that that's not really, I don't think, Jesus' main point. I think his point was that we have, we have, we have keys that open doors to things that we cannot even imagine. There was a key that opened the door the heart of my family. When I came to know Jesus, I went and started sharing what I had experienced with my sisters, and they both said yes. I, had, I gave the worst ever 
evangelistic talk to my little sister. All I remember was I was a new Christian, and she was asking about what had happened because she knew I used to sell drugs, and now I wasn't, and all this stuff. And she said, what happened? And I'm going, well, it's sort of like, uh, and this is honestly all I remember about it. It's like, it was sort of like ice, and then the ice melted or something. And she's like, oh, oh. And then afterwards she goes, you know, I, I, I was kind of taught, like, well, then you asked if they want to receive Jesus. So I said, oh, do you want to receive Jesus? She goes, yeah, yeah. So I prayed with her and stuff. She actually really became a Christian. God opened her eyes through that, which just tells me the, how great God is. It's like, oh, my gosh, like an illustration about ice. Like about halfway through the illustration, I'm thinking, what am I talking about? I have no idea what I'm talking about. But there's keys in the binding and loosing. It has, Jesus uses it in the context of forgiveness a lot. That, that we, have, we have the power to go out and bring the message of forgiveness to a world around us. We have the power to go out and spread this message of the gospel of the kingdom. We are a vehicle through whom the kingdom God, of God chooses to manifest itself as we pray for the sick, as we proclaim f- forgiveness, as we live out forgiveness in people's lives. We've been given, as he said, the gates of hell, the gates of death will not overcome. One of my seminary professors said, gates don't attack. I was like, no, oh, what do you mean? He said, think about it, gates don't attack. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, God's kingdom does. Not physically or violently, but God's kingdom breaks into abusive relationships. And begins tearing down walls. God's kingdom comes and opens up. The keys to the kingdom come and open up hearts that have been shut for years. God's kingdom sets loose people who have been in bondage for years. And God's kingdom primarily is brought about through you online, in the church. You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people chosen by God. Do you realize the privilege that we all stand in? Do I realize the privilege I have being able to lead a community like that and and to help other pastors lead other communities like this? Do we realize that we're part of something so big that in the end of history God's going to, you know, when he's doing his like Grammys and his Oscars, it's going to be like nothing like what our world is. And when he does that, he's going to look and go, oh yeah, there's the, there's, you're, you're part of that part of my Jesus people. There used to be a church but it's called Jesus People Church. You're part of my Jesus people in Wycliffe, weren't you? Is that Good or bad? Depends. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for God that you use people like us. Lord, today as I'm kind of out of it from not sleeping and, and medications and sinus and all this stuff. Lord, you're you're so kind. And you choose to, to use people like Peter and James and John and, and all the people that, all the pe- early disciples. And then you choose, Lord, to use us. And you choose to do that by opening our eyes to who you are. I pray if there's anybody here today who hasn't had that chance to have their eyes open, that they would take a step of faith and go, okay, God, if you're real, show me. Jesus, if you're God, show me. And come and just renew our vision of who we are as your community and help us to continue to work together, to love each other, to serve together for your purposes, for your glory, for your coming kingdom. Help us to break down walls, to um, storm the gates of, of whatever people are stuck in, to use the keys to free people, and to be a, a force of 
of the, the movement of the kingdom outward into our world. Amen.